We're not solving the easy problems when they're easily solvable, but we're willing to spend a ton of money. At the, at the last minute, when it to save it, yeah. Right, so Nest is really getting at the root cause of so many of these things. We come to the home, take care of the entire family. We do primary care, vaccines, blood draws, everything that's in a PCP's office is in a, a bag we bring with us. CEO and co-founder. Rebecca Gee is one of the most interesting thinkers in healthcare in our country. She ran the Louisiana Department of Health. She's done all sorts of policy that's helped all sorts of people. She's run a big health system herself. Now she's running Nest, a really exciting startup that's approaching how to help moms and babies with value-based care. She's recreating the home visit, turns out, this traditional home visit. It's a great way to treat families. You can get 15 things done at once versus everyone having to go in individually. You know, the only chance we have to provide healthcare to everyone well, we have to raise productivity, help more people for less. Rebecca has some great ideas about this. Let's hear from her. And Rebecca, you ran a health system most recently, LSU Health, before starting Nest Health. But before that, you were also the former secretary of Louisiana's Department of Health, right? That's right. So you've, you've been in the government, you've been running a health system, now you're doing a startup. Like, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So I'm an OBGYN, still practicing a little bit. I have a background in health policy. I've done health policy at the federal level, doing reforms around drug pricing, maternal mortality, babies and moms outcomes. So I've done that in the public sector. And then at the state level have run under a Republican governor an initiative to improve quality. Then for Governor Edwards, a Democrat ran the state uh, health department and led the expansion of Medicaid to have a background in quality improvement. So how do you make things better in healthcare? Well, we measure them and make sure that we're actually improving things if we make a change. Um, I'm also the daughter of a university president, someone you know well, Gordon yes. Gee. So I, I grew up uh, under his wing as an only child and seeing what it meant to be in a public role and, and the impact you could have. So I always wanted to be both practicing and also having a meta impact on healthcare. And so I've really enjoyed my career. Of course, most recently at Nest, which you helped me found. Your father actually, when you're running university, sometimes you end up having to run health systems as well. So I guess he was in this world a little bit too. Oh yeah, he's run, uh, you know, he's been at seven universities. He's a 42 year tenure, uh, has more names on diplomas than any president in American history of university. So, you know, again, I had an amazing childhood, grew, to, grew up having Twyla Tharp and Brishnikov in my home, you know, traveling the world with him, have lived in other countries. And, um, you know, of course, now live in New Orleans, which is a city that brings together the French and Spanish heritage and the gumbo of Africa and all That's of those fun, fun things. And so I've found... Um, kind of a home in a city that's small but but worldly but yeah I've grown up all over the country which has been fun too because I've seen Colorado, West Virginia, Ohio, uh, Tennessee so it's been a fun uh, travel across the U.S. as I followed my dad. And, and tell us about some of your big healthcare initiatives you've done some big things with drug pricing right and innovative work around like Savaldi that was that was hepatitis C drug? That's right, Joe. Yeah, so I've, I've tended to like to find problems have come to me. And instead of saying, hey, look, this is insurmountable, I have tended to and enjoy the times in my career I've had the most fun are saying, okay, look, this is an awful problem. How do I solve this problem? And when you and I first met, we talked about, well, here are 20 problems, right, that ought to be solved. And so that was my approach as I did mm -hmm. my government work or academia. Is first, I looked at the problem of reproductive health access. How do we get access to plan B? emergency contraception, did work on that, sued Walmart, won a national lawsuit. What do you have to, to sue them for? Yeah, to, because I had a patient who went to the pharmacy to get her prescription filled for uh -huh. a prescription I wrote her for a plan B. Uh, a mom that had a, a bunch of kids, didn't want another one, mm -hmm. wanted protection, couldn't get it. And so under in the state of Massachusetts required that all commonly needed prescriptions be available in pharmacy, wow. so we won it, and then Walmart changed its national policy. So wow. that was when I was a resident at the Brigham in Boston, and so I got a taste for, wow, even as a young person in my 20s, I can uh, be an advocate and make change. And so uh, in state government really led the work to address quality outcomes for moms and kids, starting with dashboarding out what those outcomes were, then focusing on really key areas we could improve. 
and then as Secretary of Health, looked at a bunch of things. How do we run disability services better? We had a 25 year long wait list that was average wait of 13 years for kids. 25 years. 25 it was, years. It had been there for 25 years where kids That's families. That's crazy. We got rid of it by saying, look, we're going to tailor what people need when they need it rather than bucketing them into these super expensive uh, you know, waiver programs. We, um, when the hepatitis C problem came to my attention, it was because of a letter from an advocate saying, Dr. Gee, you're just a crummy person, or you know, you're not covering these drugs. I'm dying of this disease. And I thought to myself, actually, that they're kind of right. You know, this isn't right that we can't in the wealthiest country on earth, that I can't, as a health secretary, solve an infectious disease problem that is actually costing me money. So that was, we went, that was a tough one because it was just so expensive. It, it costs a Bentley, right? So for if you have, we had 90,000 people, we thought, um, on this drug. Uh, and I mean, that would need this drug if we were to eliminate the disease. It's like a billion and point eight dollars or something. It, it would be more, it was going to be more than we spent on all of K through 12 and corrections combined. In the state. In wow. the state. So you had to go negotiate, obviously. It took three years. It was, it was not yeah. only a negotiation, but it was a, a media and communication strategy. Yeah, you had that, to threaten them oh, also. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was politics because yeah. money and politics, right, as you know. Yeah. But um, we enjoyed it. And now what's exciting is Senator Cassidy, who's a hepatologist, who's really one of the mm -hmm. Republican thought leaders, as well as the Biden administration, the President Biden put an initiative into his budget this year that was mirrored off of what we did in Louisiana. And now I've been working with Francis Collins, who ran the NIH for a long time on democratizing this innovation across states in the US to be able to have a polio type approach, right? So how do we take an infectious disease and virtually eliminate it so that our future wow. um, children won't have to deal with it? That's so, awesome. So you're that's working cool. on a lot of really cool areas of, of health policy right now. I want to set the stage because you decided to jump into one of them for now, because Nest Health, Nest Health, you mentioned you worked on outcomes for moms and their and babies, and, and that's something you're obviously very passionate about. But zooming, zooming out for a second, like I want to get your thoughts in general about healthcare. Healthcare costs are going up every year. Uh, productivity in this space is declining. It's one of the only places where productivity goes tends to go down over time, which is, yep. which is crazy. Outcomes seem to be relatively flat. What, what's going on? Yeah, we have a crummy healthcare system in the US, right? We spend way too much money on it, and we don't get good outcomes for our money. And that spend is crowding out spending on, I mean, as Secretary of Health, I knew it was a zero sum game, right? The US can yeah. Print money and borrow from China. Well, you can't when you run a state. You have a zero sum game. So when one thing goes up, another goes down. So when healthcare spending goes up, education spending goes mm -hmm. down. And arguably, health is more related to education than healthcare. Yep. Um, and, and you don't actually don't have to argue very much to, to make that point. So, you know, it was frustrating to me. And, uh, but the problem is the political machine uh, is very interested in keeping the status quo, right? So you have all of these companies making a ton of money. So you have the you health know. systems, you have yeah. the doctors groups, you have the pharma groups, yeah. you have you know, all sorts of others, I'm sure too. Right. And then it becomes a political battle. So I work for a Republican governor and the, the I mean, for a Democratic governor and the Republicans would always say, oh, you know, you're spending so much money. You guys are wasteful. So I would say I had my list. I had my list yeah. of 15 programs and I would mm -hmm. bring it to the legislature and say, look, these are the things I have to pay for to have a Medicaid program. If we don't yeah. pay for these things, we'll lose $10 billion. Here's all the stuff that we can choose to pay for. Tell me what you want on this list. They to don't want gone. to choose either. They'll be in trouble. Yeah, 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 yeah. No so one they, wants to they choose. Would like, they would yeah. say, they would throw up their hands and say, we want to pay for all of it. And I would say, well, then if that's the case, don't that you're say You're spending so the, much and you're being yeah, wasteful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't, tell, yeah. don't tell me it's the Democrats' fault. I, right. I, think I think both sides do this, where as soon as someone yeah. actually gives a concrete answer, it's so easy to attack, but no one wants to put forward a plan that yeah. actually works. Yeah, because you make an enemy and you know, nobody well, so, wants Well, so what's the answer? So to, to, to me, yeah. some of the answer is that you need more competition, you need less cronyism, you need to make it easier to compete with, with all, every sort of level of this complex, but but I mean, what what are, what are the answers for you? Well, part of the problem, Joe, is there's not transparency. I, I thought about this a lot. I was I was thinking about my husband and my kids and their healthcare recently. You know, you get information. Great example is a surgeon, right? So, I I was trained as a surgeon. The only people who know how good the surgeon is truly are, well, either you have a national data set showing outcomes, which we don't, yep. except for a few small Surgeons things. probably don't want that. They don't want they, it. Maybe a couple of them might. Yeah. So, but, you, but the yeah. people who operate with that guy or yeah. gal know how good they are, but that isn't democratized information. So yeah. there's, there's an, the, the problem is you want, in a competitive environment, you want parity of information, ability yep. to access it, and it's truly not there in healthcare. And so you've got, and you've also got this, in my view, human rights issue where you don't want want to be in a country that can afford 
to pay for the basics, you know, babies dying of starvation. And you have to pay yeah. for the basics. Right. The yeah. basics, right? So yeah. then, but then you get to, well, what do I need? And so this is my view on what should happen is not everyone should have everything they want and need exactly when they need it. So we need to, you know, there've been a lot of policy proposals. I think the best ones look like you have some kind of national system that provides a floor. I mean, Medicaid is sort of that. It's expanded. And states like Texas, unfortunately, you don't have that. You still want competition to provide the floor though, right? So maybe you're paying for the floor for everyone, but then you want to make it efficient and you get a product yeah. Yeah. Private companies, just like we do now, providing. But that. right now, the productivity is not going up. It's going down. Right. And the way that we budget and contracts for states is so, for example, well, Medicare is a problem because Medicare can go, the spend can go up and up. And, you know, there's not a lot of controls. In, Medicare drug prices are the best example of this, where there's been tremendous political will to change drug pricing, to negotiate them. And yet we are still have made very little progress. There's so, someone in the background who seems to kill it every time they get really close to fixing it. There it, must be some really good lobbyists. Uh, pretty much, yeah. yeah. In Louisiana, when I my first year as secretary, when I started to take on this issue, there were three lobbyists hired for every legislator in wow. my state. Yes. And these are health system lobbyists. They're, they're AMA, doctors groups. They're pharma. They're everyone? Pharma. Just that, for pharma. Just for pharma, there just was three. Just for pharma. Pharma lobbyists. Just for pharma, there are three per legislator. Three per wow. legislator. Yes. Yes. That's so, amazing. Yes. Yeah, so the doctors, so it's it's complicated, but we've now got this convoluted system where you've had the whack-a-mole. I mean, the problem is it's a whack-a-mole concept. You know, you get rid of fraud and be somewhere and it pops up somewhere else. So I think um, the way to deal with this is either, um, you know, Senator Cassie and I disagree a little bit on the contours, but some kind of a block grant program that's realistic where you cap spending and truly... Um, you, need to, you need scarcity somehow. Yeah, you need some scarcity, right. And then you should reward value. And what we're finding at NAS, Joe, is that the value proposition, for especially for Medicaid, it's so nascent, is these companies don't really know how to do value. They don't, they don't understand how to do value. So let's, 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 jump, yeah. in, let's jump into NAS. Yeah. So you're passionate uh, about moms and babies. You're an OBGYN. Yep. And so NAS is, NAS is going to try to do value-based care in this yeah. area. Tell, yeah. tell, what, what is that? Tell us about that. I'm a parent of five and including two sets of twins and have run initiatives at the state and national level for maternal and child health. So at the state, I led the efforts to reduce maternal mortality. At the state, I led the quality initiatives around how do we take safe care of sick kids and NICUs, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't change the delivery system. And so I was frustrated by the fact that we continue to have bad, you know, poor access to primary care. Mm -hmm. You had very high unintended pregnancy, very high um, chronic disease that was untreated in women prior to pregnancy. And then that causes a lot of the issues. A lot of the issues. And after you've got so many children who for lack of medical care are not being, their their, um, developmental delays are not being picked up. We're not solving the easy problems when they're easily solvable, but we're willing to spend a ton of money. At the the last minute, I wanted to save it, yeah. Right, so Nest is really getting at the root cause of so many of these things. We come to the home, take care of the entire family, we do primary care, vaccines, blood draws, everything that's in a PCP's office, is in a, a bag we bring this with is, us. This is really interesting. I was just reading Peter Atia's book and he talks about medicine 3.0 versus 2.0 and his framework is medicine 2.0 waits till the last minute and then treats the the thing and medicine yes. 3.0, you're thinking about it even years ahead of time. And so, so, you, so you, you say that kind of goes a little bit along with the value-based framework in, the, in that way too? That's right. We're creating what we hope to be generational change. We've already seen it and I, I can share a couple of stories of families we've seen, but we're going to create generational change what, what, in those yeah, families. What's the story? What's the way you, what's the way you make a change? Yeah, so family last week. Mom had five kids. She calls us because she has a two-year-old with an earache. Uh, We get in the home. Turns out she's eight days after having a baby. Neither she or her baby had been examined. There was no plan to get to the hospital. Well, she had the baby in the home, which is there? No, she had the baby in the hospital. hospital, but then came home. No follow-up for her. No follow-up. No transportation. No husband. No partner. So it's too hard for her to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Other kids at home. The yeah. other kids were behind on their vaccines. They were at risk of losing their ability to go to school. If they hadn't gotten their vaccines, they wouldn't have been able to attend school next yeah. year. Wow. And the family had used the ER seven times. Yeah, which, is, they, which is their only option when it's that, yeah, that's yeah. horrible. So in one visit, Joe, we took care of everything, right? So think about a parent with five kids. Oh, so you went and you vaccinated them, you checked out the baby. Everyone. Screened the mom for depression. 
looked at the home. There were roaches in the home. She couldn't afford. We we got yeah. Mm-hmm. We got um, you know, how do you do bug abatement? We got that involved. There's so actually we, like certain just types of things you can help with. Uh, the roaches, I wouldn't have thought of as something you would maybe help with, but you have to well, do whatever. It's gonna create the create the right environment for the kids, I guess. Yeah, you have a kid. We had a kid in, with asthma in the home. So yeah. if you don't deal with the roaches, so the bottom line is that, that, that some of the situations, and that's one family. We've had a bunch of families, some with autism with one child, mm-hmm. but we've seen unimaginable challenges in homes where we can go into a home where that parent, that family could have met, never have gotten care. How, how does that intersect with healthcare? Should we be coaching people in certain bad situations how to get out of it into a better place? Well, I think one of the things is a, it's people need to be, you know, if you're depressed, and that's why Nest is such an important model, right? Mm-hmm. The well being of parents and children are intimately connected. Yep. If mom is not, is depressed. Yeah. If mom has issues with substance use disorder, if dad is depressed, has issues with substance use disorder, or if, you know, if kids have untreated disease, that whole family is not well, and you get into a vicious cycle, right? So part of it is breaking that. Part of it is, Joe, is having an example of, okay, all of our, one of the things we're proud of is all of our family advocates have been on Medicaid and have come from the community we serve. So they so understand what they're dealing with. Understand. And they and also, respect people. Yeah, but also to say, look, here I am. I am a Nest family advocate. I'm here to help you. And people can say, oh man, that's a career path that's that cool. I could take. So part of it also is we're doing enrollment assistance with families. So let's say you're not eligible for Medicaid anymore because you get a job, but you want healthcare through the exchange. We can help you do that and continue to provide care for you. So That's we're cool. really excited. I think part of it is, um, part of it is simply that, you know, when you have in this country, we do not have a system that provides adequate child care support. I mean, we know this, I, you know, we, it's really hard to find daycare. It's really for single moms, especially, it's just gonna be really tough for them to, to even do any of the healthcare stuff because they're so busy without help, without daycare if they can't afford it. That's right. and most. Most in Louisiana, most low income moms are single moms for obvious reasons, right? One income leads to lower income. And so for that family, and so then it's a cycle. And, you know, when you don't have transportation to go to your visit to get birth control to prevent the next pregnancy, you're, then you have additional pregnancy. So overall, you're obviously, you're, you're, you're saving kids and you're cutting costs, which is really positive. It sounds like there's like beyond this, there's like larger cultural issues and life coach issues, which I guess are not the not the purview of Ness, but is that, do you think about those at all when you look at that? Cause there must be all these other things like you like kind of want to teach people how to, how to do certain things. Well, I, I don't see it as much as life coaching as th- that there's the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So, so you see, once you help them with the basics, they can, they can figure it out themselves a lot of times. Right. So like I can, I can think meta because I am not hungry. Yep. I don't. And, and by the way, we have even people who work for us who've said, I don't have a meal for my kids tonight. And that's on, you know, when even at $20 an hour in this country, if you're trying to pay rent, you're trying to pay your bills, you have three kids, that's not enough necessarily to get all your basic needs met. So you're dealing with people who are having tremendous challenges. So I think we got to have kind of the basics covered, especially and arguably, look, there's, you can have tons of policy debates on, um, should we be doing this for everyone? But I think we could all agree as a country that for, for babies and those children in the early years, it's a great investment well, for us to think about. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, yeah. I mean, A, it's, we should be taking care of babies and children morally, yeah. but B, yeah. you're actually bringing down the costs, right? Is that, is that that's, you actually, because they're not gonna use the emergency room as much, they're now, it's not gonna, you're, you're not only helping them, but you're gonna make it, the whole system well, be more efficient. Absolutely, and think about Joe, if we find, and we're doing hearing and vision screening for kids that aren't getting it, we pick up just that one thing. And you know, in New Orleans alone, 59% of children do not get their well care. 59% wow. of kids did not go to the visits. So think about just the downstream impacts of that one vision screen, okay? So five-year-old doesn't get vision screen. Five-year-old can't read. Think about the life course of that individual not being able to work. No, we figured out our three-year-old daughter needed glasses, which was you know, which is really important. That'd be crazy if you just didn't figure that out forever. And to, to, to step back a bit on this, I'm, I'm curious, like, like, are there like, are there lots of maternal deaths in like, baby deaths you're preventing or it's much more it's much more just about like the health overall like how how's like, like what are the what are the key things you're, you're fixing there sure so we're focused on you know just first and foremost vaccines mental health well visits making sure baby's growing making sure baby's feeding we've already as i said we've been to a family with a baby that hadn't been seen you know part of the nest so, model is 
how's baby sleeping? You, you actually led an effort as Secretary of Health in Louisiana to, to improve birth outcomes. Like, what were the key things yeah. to improve the outcomes? It was just how, how they're sleeping, is that kind of stuff? That's important. But I mean, certainly as Secretary, I focused on hospitals because that was in my purview. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are we treating hemorrhage when it's happening? Are we treating hypertension when it's happening? Um, are we safely delivering babies at the right time? Are we doing C-sections only when needed. So that was kind of before and now and now really focused around and then also birth spacing. Are we are we able to and Louisiana made huge strides in availability of birth control. You know, our planned pregnancies happening at a greater rate. Now we're focused on okay, you've gotten we've seen this at home. You've got a mom who went home with high blood pressure. So half of maternal mortality happens after moms go home. So, and a lot of it's cardiovascular. So she had an enlarged heart, right? She had high blood pressure, but no one's checking. We know that moms will, even though, and I gave you the data on kids, 59% don't get all their well visits. Even fewer moms get their care. Mm -hmm. They're focusing on their kids first. So if they're not getting their hypertension treated, they can have a stroke. They can have chronic morbidity. You know, if they have gestational mm -hmm. diabetes, 50% of them will have diabetes. That doesn't wow. get treated. You know, then you get, you know, diabetic foot ulcers, all, you know, put this you know, down the line. Yeah. So it's about, and then with kids, it's avoid, you know, when we looked, we were talking to parents also about how do you, you know, we're treating depression. We're helping with parenting skills. So all of these things lead to, okay, or let's say, one example I like is we helped a dad who was smoking, right? Dad smoking, we have two and seven year olds with asthma. Got it. So we're now, we help dad quit smoking. That not only helps him and reduces his cost of getting cancer and whatnot, mm, but now we've kids. dealt with the asthma problem. No, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting because house calls were generally the thing, it was the norm, it was what, you, what people did before, and then that kind of went away. And it's, it's kind of, a, it's interesting because you're saying with Nest Health, Part of the value-based care thing is the house call. It's just so much more efficient to help families. Why do they go away? And what, why, and, you know, what do we have to do to bring it back? Well, I think there were policy initiatives um, that did a lot of, you know, there was, there's a, a saying in, health, in uh, public health called Romer's Law, a bed built is a bed filled. Right, so there were these there were these huge investments post World War II to build a bunch of infrastructure, and then the medical establishment was like, "Oh, I'm going to set up in these buildings." You got to monetize it once you right. built it. Yeah, so it's not, and then you know, then then the health systems have an interest. Well, I want to build because I can build higher if it's a clinic. They get paid a lot more if you're coming into the health system than if they're going taking care of 14 things at once in the in the house. Bingo. Yeah. So that's why this only works, in our view, in a value-based care initiative. We want to get paid to do better, do less with bigger savings, um, do the right thing. Th this is the key. So, this is the key point. Yeah. Rather than getting paid for everything you're doing, you want to get paid to have a certain family you're keeping healthy, or a certain set of mom and kids you're keeping healthy. Exactly. So the principle is: give us. You know, you would already be paying for primary care. You would already be paying something for care coordination. Give that to us, and then let's true up at the end of the year. How much did we save you? We'll get some of the savings. You keep some of the savings. So it's a, you know, it's a, a really. We are the first mover company in this space to take care of the entire family. And Joe, we talked about why the whole family we think is a bigger opportunity for savings. Because if you're just picking off each individual separately, treating the conditions separately with different provider teams, you're not actually addressing. You can do it much more efficiently if you're taking care of everyone. So we think that we're we're in a really exciting place, but also we're driving this for kids. There is no other company right now that's taking care of that moderate risk child in the startup land. So we're the first mm -hmm. there and really excited to be, of course, you've got a ton of demonstrations and a ton of successful companies like Oak Street that have done this in Medicare. Mm -hmm. We're taking those same principles and saying, why don't we take care of young people where we can actually have a lifetime of value. And, and it's notoriously difficult to innovate within Medicaid. You're starting in Louisiana and Medicaid. Like, why, like, obviously you're based in Louisiana, so yeah. you're starting there, but but why, why Medicaid and, and how are you managing to innovate there? Yeah, Medicaid's really hard. Actually, my, when I ran Medicaid, my staff got, I didn't condone this, but they all got t-shirts made one day that said Medicaid is hard and wore them. And I was like, that's <laughs> totally the wrong message, but <laughs> it is really hard. And um, because there's the idiosyncrasy of state policy, there is a government framework that's federal, but there's so much variation. And then there's high burnout and high turnover. So there are very few people that understand it like I do, right? I've been a secretary of health. I've been right. a medical director. I've 
run and been responsible for the Medicaid program. My co-founder has worked for both Geisinger and Kaiser. She's worked for Landmark. She's got deep experience in FQHC. So she, it's kind of so. If you guys account. can't innovate here, no one can. That's that's the that's the. If, so you're if, gonna prove it's possible. We're gonna prove it's possible, and it's hard. Look, people laughed it when I first started this, and this was with you. I I want to credit mm-hmm. you, Joe, because this all came, this would not have happened if not for you wanting to make a difference for this population and to solve an issue that we have with government where you've got this issue um, where you do, you have a spend for moms and kids, but you're not getting better outcomes for it. So you and I talked about, well, what can we do better? It's it's infuriating to spend so much money and then, and then these people are suffering. It's just, it's insane because it's it's misaligned. It's misalignment. And so we've got an A team that understands Medicaid. We've got incredible advisors. We've got the resources. So so how do you scale this up? You have to go in and you have to, you have all these top, people and you're going to go in and you're going to help a ton of moms and kids. I love this about healthcare is like our job is to help all of them do really, really well and spend less money. Yeah. And yeah. then people will see that that's like a really a great thing. And then yeah. other states are going to want to partner with you on it. Like how are, are there health systems, our insurance companies? How does it work? How do you, how do you scale it? Yeah. So we're going to do great in Louisiana first, but we also have a new anchor funder that is the Blue Venture Fund. And what's lovely about that is that they're also our, one of our largest end customers. So they have an interest in our success. So we're already talking to Hawaii and Arkansas and Illinois and West Virginia and Kentucky. So they're the payer in those places. They want to say, prove this works and then please come do it for us because you're going to save us money and help the people in our states. Bingo. That's awesome. What's the, what's the timeline? How's that, how's that, does it take years to prove it works in one place? Healthcare always seems like it's slow, you know? Well, one of the, so one of the things I, I, I feel really blessed to be starting this company at one of the toughest times you can start a company where there's yes. just, <laughs> if I had started this with you a couple of years ago, we would have had more time to prove it out. But the bottom line is, you know, we've raised a great round. We had, um, we, we raised 15 million, which is more than we had set out to, to raise. And that gives us a lot of time. It gives us till the end of 24 or maybe beginning of 25. So the bottom line is we have to prove it before then um, because because that's the way the startup. And that's a nice thing. Look, there, you've got an experiment. We're going to be really diligent. We're going to make those shifts, um, but we're going to prove it in the next year. And the first six months are going to be critically important for us as we especially prove out that we can engage families, which is one of the hardest things, you know, that, that we can establish trust and go into the home and mm-hmm. see as many people as we predicted with this care team that's anchored by a nurse practitioner. And then we're talking about Louisiana expansion in 24 and then other state expansions in 25. And, and who's, who's, is there someone trying to stop you or who would try to stop you? Are there health systems to be threatened by this and they wouldn't want it to work? You no, know, our biggest competition is no care. Really? So what happens is we disarm them by showing them data, which I've, oh. I've, I've found to be very important throughout my career is people say, oh yeah, you're going to take our patients. And I say, wait a minute, let's look at the data. Okay. Uh, 59% of these kids didn't see you. Mm-hmm. We'll take those. You keep the other ones. Yeah. Well, then, yeah. 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 So, so ultimately you're getting, helping more kids. I hope long-term you do take their patients, but we shouldn't say that on the Yeah, well, we're not, we're not, well, (laughs) well, but but we, but value-based care is about doing something. You'll you'll take the patients they don't, they don't need to be seeing for the basics to prevent them. And then they'll have the patients, if there's an acute thing, if there's something that goes on, they still get those. True. But Joe, another criteria we have for the NAS selection. So what we're doing is a closed cohort process where we go to the health plan. We know what these people cost because we've done the research and we say, look, we know these people cost X give us a, give us this list and we'll take risk with you on this population. Yep. It's not everybody in Medicaid. What we know is that people that don't see their PCP are higher cost and those people are on our list. So a lot of the people that we're selecting just by virtue of our algorithm that's proprietary haven't used healthcare. So it's kind of, it doesn't, we, you know, there, I'm sure there's always going to be someone that feels a little threatened but A, we're first mover, so we don't have competition in the startup world. We yeah. don't have a VBC company coming in. Well, it's a hard thing to build, so it's not a surprise. It's yeah. a hard thing to build. Yeah. It's and, a hard thing to build. And yeah, no, and, and, you're, and you're taking seeing patients that weren't t- getting right. care otherwise, weren't having primary care brought otherwise. Stepping back, because you've done so much in policy in this world, like, like what should policymakers be doing to make this easier so that, so that more Rebecca Gies can come and start companies to do things like this? Like, or what else should we be doing to, to fix the system? Well, we need more Joe Lonsdales. It's a real deficit to have not started a company before. I hadn't. I, my background was all in government, which is what you need to start a Medicaid company, right? Yeah. You have to understand it. To, to have worked in it gives you the best opportunity to understand it. But generally, who gets funded are people that come from that world uh, that is the um, you know either the financial side or they've already done a startup, which means that you don't get those outside ideas. So you're willing to bet on people 
and I've seen this in so many of your companies who are coming in with a different idea. They want to take a crack at it from a totally different perspective. So we need more of that. We need more venture funds that are willing to take a bet on big intractable problems and support founders who are expert but may not have and then support as you did with avc then surround them with people who know how to build that dynamic yeah i've slowly learned this over time it's not all 23 year old tech wizards that are the ones that can build everything we need there's we need a good combination of different types of people who have actual different experience especially for healthcare yeah but i would love a 23 year old tech wizard well you need that too yeah yeah. no no, we need we need them we'd still need them too i agree well hopefully after you make this into a multi-billion dollar company you can help find several more people to to fix areas are there other areas in, in in healthcare you wish more people were going at right now with this type of approach yeah well well i think hopefully we'll start some more companies i think I you know it. there's uh, there's uh huge problems with opioid use disorder mental health there's the transition from incarceration to you know the working I'm world really, i'm really passionate about that one That's, i think there's just the incentives for how we help people come out of incarceration and how there's all the programs around that are so broken and it's it's just crazy because all of us want the same thing. I don't care if you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. Like you want people coming out and you want them to be healthy. You want them to have employment. You don't want them to go back yeah. to prison, right? And you want these yeah. communities to, to, to thrive. And it just drives me crazy that, that we, the way we do it right now. Yeah. And then also, I agree. I totally agree. And that's I think that would be a great company to start. Love to help you with Trying that. Trying to do nonprofit stuff. There'd be a right. I probably should yeah. just, nonprofits are so hard. I probably should just do company stuff. Company you know? stuff. Because that's a, yeah. that's why people ask me all the time. Okay, you've had this whole career and, and you're a bleeding heart liberal. Yeah. You know, and you've, you've done all this work in government. How, why are you in the, the dirty for-profit sector? And I say to them, because it scales. You can actually fix stuff with it. You fix stuff. And when you make money, it grows, right? I know. For the, for the, yeah. for that coming out of prison, all that stuff, I really, I probably get really attacked if I did it in a for-profit way. So I'm like, I'm like okay, <laughs> well, I'm just going to try to be good. But yeah, but maybe it's still the right thing. Sometimes if you're not doing something, if you're not getting attacked, you might not be doing anything important. So Well, yeah. the problem, Joe, is the people that are in for-profit prison business are yeah, running terrible. prisons. Yeah. And their interest is in keeping people in jail. Which is terrible. I think we have to totally change how for-profit prisons work, but the only way they make profit is is for more employment and lower recidivism. Like I think we should totally change yeah. that whole thing. It's like healthcare. Yeah. Like you want to empty the hospital? Like we should pay hospitals to be empty. Talk optimism for the future. Yes. If we step back, yes. you know, we've talked about all these issues in our society let's conclude with what it looks like if we get it right like if more broadly if companies like nest and other companies and other things you build confront these different areas what does healthcare what does our society look like in a decade i mean it's so exciting you know that there's every the the pace of innovation is accelerating more quickly than any other time in human history so you know i am an advisor to a company called 3d systems that's printing literally printing organs i love that so that we don't have to you know use people who are nearly dead for transplanting i mean so they're or 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 just cut out they just cut out a piece of my quad tendon to make my acl that i had replaced we could have manufactured it. i would have appreciated that the quad is quite painful and it turns off for a month after yeah that hurts (laughs) see in the future you could just put your like a couple cells into a petri dish and then we'll grow your quad if my wife lets me go hello skiing again and we'll do that next time. <laughs> but yeah, no, but that there's that kind of like the pace of innovation. I can put one drop of blood on a slide and you can know. I mean, obviously, uh, there's a big brother aspect to this of, you know, you can know from that one drop of blood what diseases I'm going to have and how much is it going to cost to insure me. Um, however, the, just there's so many options to to sustain life, to improve the quality. There's more of life. positives than negatives from what you can learn to help people, right? That's, Absolutely. Yeah. And then value based care, right? We're, it's growing. So we're going to figure out as a country that we got to get healthcare costs down a little bit. And you've got tons of innovation. It's spreading. How much can value-based care bring the costs down if it's done right? Like, well, how should we think about that? Uh, not exponentially, but... Maybe it, slow the growth at least. But it could slow <laughs> the growth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot, hopefully a lot. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think we're in like 150 trillion of debt or something if you include healthcare costs. So that's to me the biggest issue fiscally, right? And, and so it's just working on things like what you're working on are critical if we're going to work. But but sounds sounds like you're optimistic we're going to get there. We're going to do better. Look, our kids are smarter than than we are. Our world is getting better. So I think you know the opportunities that I have uh, to to make a difference in this world are much much greater than those that my mother had. Uh, I don't know about my dad, but you know, I, I think your dad's I mean, a legend, but you'll be a legend, a legend too. <laughs> so, so, um, I'm grateful. You know, I think this is a, a, an incredible world and, um, it's wonderful for me to have this chance to work on something that is so meaningful. Right. So even if, um, we, 
you know, everything is learning when we're innovating and we're, we're learning about how these families work. And so even if we're just doing primary care and we're just picking up, you know, hearing and vision, just, just the little things we're doing are making sense. Well, they say in Judaism, if you save one life, you save the whole world. So it's, it's, it's amazing work you're doing, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Joe. 